Inglés es un pinche puto pendejo cabrón. Ay, no mames, dicen ustedes que no sabía que iba a hablar en castellano. Hoy ves, me es me muero. Sorry, I forgot to mention I was going to do the talk in Spanish. Ah, just kidding. Actually, it probably doesn't even matter because you guys are all polyglots, so probably everyone speaks Spanish anyway or have at least dabbled on Duolingo. Um, <laughs> but my point in beginning with palabrotas is that we've become rather complacent in accepting English as the unmarked language of choice. That is to say, the choice that appears to be neutral, that flies under the radar of righteous indignation. Unless we happen to be French. Uh, or Yanko Peretz. <laughs> uh, Spanish makes a statement. English does not. Or does it? Before I started cur cursing like a Spanish sailor, I was actually attempting to quote a Canadian author's musings on English in which he challenges the notion that we can ever defend the purity of our tongue, which he claims to be as pure as a puta. Not translating, my, my abuelita is watching. Um, we don't just borrow words, states James Nichol. On occasion, English has pursued other languages down alleyways to beat them unconscious and rifle their pockets for new vocabulary. Considering that the origins of this quote take up half of his Wikipedia page, this tidbit of wisdom has clearly traveled the globe. But why? Because it captures the power and balance that English holds. The language hasn't simply cozied up to other native tongues like a wayward kitten, but rather like a jabberwock has devoured dozens in its wake. Take my home state, California, for instance, where <laughs> 80 or 90 indigenous languages from seven entirely distinct language families used to be spoken. Anthropologist Edward Sapir claimed that in the state of California alone, there are far greater variety of languages than the whole of Europe. Though sadly, many of these are now sleeping, uh, some aspects of our linguistic diversity remain in that, for instance, 44% of Californians out of 40 million people speak a language other than English at home. So some of you might be like, oh, why is she not talking about Central Asia? I, starting with a multi-metalinguistic tirade instead of diving into my topic here for today. And that is because in Central Asia, where I conducted my doctoral fieldwork, there is no neutral linguistic choice. Here's where I need a map, since some of you might be a little fuzzy on your former, central, uh, so former Soviet Central Asian republics. Uh, and I realized that after a friend of mine mentioned that uh, she would be in Germany for the summer, so maybe she could like bop over to Kyrgyzstan while I was there. And I was like, I was like, okay, well, Kyrgyzstan borders China, but you know, you're always welcome. I do want to offer a disclaimer, since I'm going to be recounting a darker chapter of Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyzstan's history, that it is in fact a lovely country that you should all visit. Uh, no visa required. Some restrictions may apply. <laughs> it is the best stand, just saying. Um, dubbed the Switzerland of Asia. Sorry, no chocolate, but dried yogurt balls do grow on you. Uh, it is known for its stunning uh, alpine scenery, and also the tremendous hospitality of its people. Uh, also, my field site of Osh in the south of the country, um, you can see right there, Osh, um, is a polyglot's dream in that everyone knows at least three languages, uh, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, and Russian. And for those of you, since we're all language nerds here, want to know the juicy details, Kyrgyz and Uzbek are Turkic languages. Um, Kyrgyz is a little bit more pure in the sense that it retains the features of Turkic, such as vowel harmony, um, whereas Uzbek is kind of intermixed with Persian, so it has less of that. Um, in Russian, you all know, it's sami bagati yazik na svieti, konyashna. Okay, davai, dalshe. Okay, so the point of my talk today, or the motive, I should say, aside from courting a position at the Kyrgyz Ministry of Tourism, is to explain the concept of language ideology um, by applying it to some juicy ethnographic anecdotes, as well as to offer a few tidbits of my own language ideology, aka propaganda. Um, language ideology, although it has a fancy sounding academic definition, basically refers to people's attitudes about the merits of one particular language over another. These opinions on language, when further unpacked, 
rarely have to do with the languages themselves, but rather subtly encompass assumptions and judgments regarding the speakers of those languages themselves. For example, the English-only movement, which we heard a little bit about um, in the excellent presentation um, yesterday afternoon, um, which works to make, um, in the United States at least, in this context, um, make uh, English the official language of the United States, which it's not, ha ha ha, um, and as well as to oppose bilingual education initiatives, um, seems to operate on the assumption that there's some committed core of immigrants who willfully spite the linguistic knowledge that would improve their socioeconomic conditions and sort of ab ignores all the other barriers that might prevent um, their language acquisition, such as age or isolation, poverty, working two jobs. Um, and the truth is that privilege, as well in race as well as in language, renders itself invisible to those who hold it. Americans simply expect that they will have access to a wealth of entertainment, literature, ed educational options, um, legal proceedings, and international travel without ever even having to learn a simple gracias. Um, power erases its traces, and just by virtue of being here in Salonika and speaking multiple languages, we all have our own responsibilities that come with that privilege. Uh, so my advice is, be a language superhero, like these guys. <laughs> Um, dress down your dialect in the sense that when you have a choice, uh, if you can, choose to learn and speak in the language of the oppressed, of the downtrodden, over the language of the powerful. And this is certainly the case in Kyrgyzstan, since I'm going to be talking about a minority group, um, Uzbeks living in Kyrgyzstan. But the reason why um, Kyrgyz are very sensitive um, to this issue of language is because, as you can see from this poster, because um, you all read Kyrgyz, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it says, Bugun Kyrgyzstan bar, erteng jok bulop ketishe mongkun. Which means that today, Kyrgyzstan might exist, but tomorrow, maybe not. Um, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, it's, it's no heavyweight in the international arena. It is one of the, the little guys in the sense that there's only a six million uh, population, and it's about the size of Senegal. Um, and it's surrounded by much more powerful countries, by China, Uzbekistan, which has a population of like 28 million, um, Kazakhstan, which even though it has a smaller population, has oil and other um, natural resources, and then of course, Russia. So you have um, these three powers here sort of all like eating up Kyrgyzstan, and they're just imagining that their future is very precarious. And so they think the same thing about their language, that it's sort of like, even though it has national support, they're very sensitive about it and think that um, it it's actually is in danger, um, which, which is an interesting perspective. Um, but, uh, so Kyrgyz feel sort of like they're an oppressed minority, even though in their own country, so, so to speak, um, I say own because that, that has its own delicate history, they are the majority, about 65% of the population is Kyrgyz, um, about 15% Uzbek, um, and then the rest are Russians and other minorities like Tatars and um, various groups that were sort of forcibly um, um, sent to Central Asia by Stalin in the 40s. Um, yet in Osh, where I lived, Uzbeks comprise about 50% of the population, so they're a significant minority in the South. Um, so if we want to check out the South, the reason why I titled this project Lives on the Line is not just because uh, lives are at stake in this conflict that I'm gonna be addressing, um, but because, as you can see, the Uzbekistani border is there, along with a lot of other borders. Um, and, and there's not just one, but many. There are literally um, islands of Uzbekistan in Kyrgyzstan. The, the borders in the Fergana Valley are perplexing. It's almost as if someone spilled a cup of coffee and just sort of arbitrarily drew lines um, where the stains were. These lines are not complete happenstance, though, um, but they were decided out um, in the early Soviet period in the 1920s. Back then, it didn't really matter where one place Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan. All the ethnic groups were mixed up in these areas anyway, um, in this Fergana, Ali, Fergana Valley area. That's um, Fergana Valley in Uzbek up there. <laughs> um, for centuries, and people didn't even actually distinguish themselves in ethnic terms. This was like a sort of Soviet imposition. Uzbeks tended to think of themselves, they were the traditionally settled peoples um, based on the city where they lived. So if they were from Kashgar, which is now located in China, in Xinjiang, um, they would be considered a Kashgar Lik, or if they're from Osh, they're an Osh Lik. Um, it didn't, they didn't call themselves Uzbek in that sense. Um, and then Kyrgyz, would, um, who were traditionally nomadic, would identify themselves based on the clan or the tribe that they were a part of. Um, so Soviets thought that employing, by employing the idiom of ethnicity and empowering each group 
with their own territory that these Muslim, Turkic, and Persian language speakers would sort of rally behind their cause. Um, they did, but the strategy would prove disastrous decades later when the Soviet Union unraveled. Now for an Uzbek woman in Uchkorgan, Kyrgyzstan, um, which you might be able to see somewhere. Uh, it's right where it says Kuzulkia. Um, if she wants to go visit her daughter in Kuvasai, which is just on the other side of the border, a trip that took her 20 minutes um, 20 years ago now takes her half a day, basically, to wait at the border um, just to be allowed to cross. Um, so the, these lines have real consequences for people's um, daily lives. So something's not right with this poster here. Let me explain. So Stotonitak. Um, this newly international border created other problems, uh, like a greater sense of competition for scarce resources, uh, such as land and water. So in 1990, for instance, in Osh and other parts of the south of Kyrgyzstan, there was a violent clash that broke out across ethnic lines, mainly between Kyrgyz and Uzbeks, over who is entitled to certain pieces of land. Uh, this mural promoting peace marked the border of the Uzbek neighborhood where I lived in Kyrgyzstan. But what's the problem with this? Here you can see the town's three languages represented. Um, for those of you who speak Russian, you can probably guess what it says. Does anyone know? Friendship. Yeah, friendship, exactly. Um, so it's Kyrgyz, Uzbek, and Russian. So the Kyrgyz is in the red, Russian in the blue, and the Uzbek is in the green. What's the problem with this? So the reason why this is upsetting is because the green with Uzbekistan is linking it to the flag, uh, the, sorry, the green that represents Uzbeks, ethnic Uzbeks, is linking it to the Uzbekistani flag, which is a neighboring country. So all of a sudden you have this ethnic minority in Kyrgyzstan that's already seen as this alien outside other, and they're being sort of yoked or attached to that and don't really have a chance to be seen as native to this region when in fact they've lived there for, for many centuries longer than the Kyrgyz have because they were traditionally nomads and were forcibly settled in the cities by the Soviets. Um, so basically um, this, the root problem of this conflict um, that broke out, which in a way was like increasing inequality um, and linking ethnicity and nationality and language all together in this, in this fall it would later cause even more problems. Um, so for instance, uh, this, for those of you who practice a, on your Greek um, before you came here, it says, does anyone know what it says? No. Not my they are not my friends, very good. Um, so on the morning of June 2010, when I was living in a majority Kyrgyz apartment building, which is right here, um, build, um, with a local family on the outskirts of town, um, my host brother, Batir, got a text. Uh, it said that Uzbek men were raping and killing Kyrgyz women, and so come and help um, defend your brothers. Uh, he was being called to fight, um, and violence had overtaken the city that day and would last for the next four days. Um, and, and many hundreds of people were killed, and half of the neighborhoods were burned down, especially the Uzbek areas. Um, but uh, the reason why this... Um, I was a little bit skeptical when I heard about the text just because I knew the history of ethnic conflict that a lot of times women are used as sort of um, tools to mo motivate ethnic violence. Um, so I asked him, what did your Uzbek's friends say about this text that you're getting? And he said, they are not my friends. <laughs> um, and so how and when this fighting broke out is still a highly controversial topic in Kyrgyzstan that few agree on. Um, but at the end of it, as I mentioned, um, the town was, much of the town was destroyed. Um, but why had it happened? A common Kyrgyz narrative states that Uzbek had started the fight in a quest to create their own ethnic autonomous enclave. Uh, the Uzbek international response and international response, on the other hand, compared it to a pogrom where an ethnic minority was targeted for annihilation. So you have two competing narratives of victimization. Both people saw themselves as the victim of this conflict. Um, so it was very controversial to say that Uzbeks were the victims. Um, the reason why I'm addressing this topic um, to you all is that language served as a kind of justification for the violence, actually. An Uzbek politician, one month before the violence broke out, had given a speech calling for Uzbek to be recognized as an official language of Kyrgyzstan. At the time, only Kyrgyz and Russian had any kind of official recognitions. And many Kyrgyz actually saw this as proof that Uzbeks were rallying for independence, and it was seen as an act of betrayal on their part. Uh, as a result of linguistic choices being heavily loaded, after the June 2010 violence, 
Uzbek language had all but disappeared from public life in Osh, in spite of them comprising half the population. My Uzbek teacher was afraid to speak to me in public in her native tongue, and even my English-speaking friends had to adopt a code word for Uzbek when conversing in public to avoid hostile stares. Um, so we referred to Uzbeks as you people and Kyrgyz as K people. We also had to adopt a code word for sex, which we referred to as shipping bananas, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> to my surprise, I managed to find one remaining sign with an Uzbek word, a closed meat stand representing the three languages of Oshigan. Um, et is Kyrgyz, is Kyrgyz for meat, Gusht is the Uzbek, and Miasa, Kanyashna, Ruskin. Um, so, uh, the reason why this was surprising is because I hadn't seen any other of signs that had a single word of Uzbek. Um, and I had, in fact, learned that Uzbek word for meat um, because I had heard my, it used earlier that day by my Kyrgyz host family. Now, why would that be the case? Um, this is another aspect of the conflict, and it is, in fact, uh, that the southern dialect of Kyrgyz is heavily, heavily influenced by Uzbek. So when a southern Kyrgyz goes to the capital in Bishkek in the north, they are actually referred to oftentimes by their northern kinsmen as the ethnic slur for Uzbeks, which is Sart. Um, so there's a complicated history as that, uh, there as well. Um, so let's see. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have therefore been surprised that by my Kyrgyz host brother's reaction when during the third day of the violence, I used the word gush. Um, the Uzbek word for meat, which he himself had used. Food had become scarce on that day, so Batir decided to go and procure some meat. Um, he came back with this. Mm. <laughs> I had never felt happier to be a vegetarian, so I was attempting to gleefully remind him that he wouldn't have to share his entrail stash with me. So I said, men gush jebeim. A perfect Kyrgyz sentence, I thought. Um, I don't eat meat, um, is what I said. But then he corrected me for my bad Kyrgyz, he said, you can't use gush, that's Uzbek. But I learned the word from you earlier today, I countered. Oh, Batir looked sheepishly at the floor. No, it's not good, Kyrgyz. <laughs> um, so a lot of the issues with local language, um, as far as sort of rich sites for hearing these instances of language ideology, occurred in lo local schools where I conducted a lot of my um, field work. So, um, for instance, uh, here's uh, some statistics on the schools there. Um, I, there was some major changes that took place as a result of the violence in 2010. Um, for instance, one Uzbek school was burned to the ground. Um, four Uzbek language sections in previous Kyrgyz schools were dropped. Um, as I mentioned, there was the public removal of Uzbeks from Uzbek from the streets, um, and people were even sometimes afraid to, to speak the language. An institution of Uzbek higher learning in the north of Osh was uh, destroyed, and the Kyrgyz Uzbek University in Osh was controversial because it had the word Uzbek in the title, so they changed it to Kyrgyz Social University. <laughs> um, but still, a large percentage of Osh schools remain Uzbek, but no one is uh, certain how much, how long that will last. Um, so Uzbek language and even the word itself, as I mentioned, sort of became tainted and also affected the way Kyrgyz teachers uh, taught other Kyrgyz students. For instance, one Kyrgyz first grader approached her Kyrgyz teacher for a piece of paper. She asked, using a counting word that's also used by Uzbeks. So the teacher grew livid. Are you Kyrgyz? She asked the startled and confused child who shrank back to her seat. These are how the boundaries of language and ethnic identity become policed. Um, what is considered proper language is linked to the speech variety of those in charge, not with any objective laws of grammar. So here's, here's an Uzbek school. I wrote Oshki Uzbek Larga Respect um, because it's, it's actually from a song, um, but it means, uh, oh, my stand is falling. It means that, um, there we go, okay. <laughs> um, show uh, Osh Uzbek's respect. Um, and I thought it was an interesting use of, of multilingualism because you have Oshki being in Russian, then you have Uzbek Large in Uzbek and then using an English word. So people mix languages very rampantly there. And yet everyone seems to have the language ideology that purity is somehow the ideal, but no one does it. They mix like crazy, which I love. <laughs> um, so, um, and sometimes in Uzbek schools, things were hard. For instance, I once heard a Kyrgyz teacher call 
a room of 10 year olds um, will tell them that all Uzbeks are dogs. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is really surprising. Not so much that she said it, because I had heard things like that before, but more the fact that I'm a foreigner in the room and she's saying it in front of me. And that was usually, um, it's a culture that's very concerned with shame. Um, so I thought that she would be ashamed, but apparently she wasn't. Um, but there are instances where um, Kyrgyz teachers were very kind to their Uzbek students. Um, I once had heard a teacher um, with a bunch of first graders, she was Kyrgyz and talking to Uzbeks. Um, she was asking them, tell me about your homeland. Like, what does your homeland look like? Is it, is it beautiful? Um, and the kids were sort of unsure because they were kind of getting conflicting messages from family and from uh, sort of the ideology of, of them being strangers in their own land. Um, so they weren't really sure, like, should we say Uzbekistan is our home? Should we say Kyrgyzstan? And then she reminded them, she's like, oh, Kyrgyzstan is your home, like, tell me about it. And then they were like, oh, Kyrgyzstan has beautiful mountains. And they were so excited. They started like sharing all the wonderful glories of Kyrgyzstan and they were made to feel like at least they have a home. So the linking of uh, language to ethnicity and, na and nationality has somewhat precarious and confusing implications for ethnic minorities like Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan. For example, um, they give such slogans like this one. It says, Til tagarla el tagarla, um, tagarla, which means the fate of a language is the fate of the people. And so this sends sort of a strange message, because uh, on the one hand, you see this in an Uzbek school, and the Uzbek students understand it because they understand Kyrgyz having it be a Turkic language. Um, but at the same time, they're getting it in the medium of Kyrgyz, so they're being told that you should really learn Kyrgyz, but they're also being told that if they essentially drop their own mother tongue, then their own culture will um, be erased forever. Um, so it's, it's sort of a contradiction that the state is sending this message to them when in fact um, they also want to preserve their own culture. But there is a solution to this problem, of course, that all polyglots know the answer. Multilingualism, hooray. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, so language choice in the Western world is often framed as a sort of decision of the capitalist-minded individual. What language is the most useful for me and to advance my career? But most people in the world speak, for most people in the world, speaking another language is not a luxury, but a necessity. And oftentimes that necessitates dropping one's own native tongue, as we just saw in the last presentation for those of you who are here. Um, and so that's why I had given the advice earlier to sort of dress down and choose the language um, with less power whenever possible. One Kyrgyz language poster in an Uzbek school read, Kyrgyz, be the language of unity and friendship. And it was a command, and I found this really puzzling. Um, it was sort of this performative utterance, like a wishful thinking that somehow you could force unity and friendship on someone. Um, and, and I'm not saying that Kyrgyz should, Uzbek students shouldn't learn Kyrgyz. They inevitably will because they have to. Um, but it's just that the ultimate act of goodwill and respect will occur when those who hold the language of power learn the language of the other. When the Kyrgyz freely speak Uzbek, when Israelis speak Arabic, or when Americans finally learn Spanish. <laughs> vale la pena. Um, in an Uzbek-speaking village uh, a few hours south of Osh, a 10-year-old Tajik kid came up to me with earnest disappointment and said, I only speak five languages. <laughs> Whenever you find this disheartening or comforting, polyglots, we're not exceptional. Um, or as my Russian teacher once elegantly put it, you're not unique snowflake and you're Russian terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we are only exceptional in the places where language hegemony has bulldozed pre-existing diversity. But most people who live in Africa, continental Europe, and Asia speak multiple languages. So my advice, um, though plagiarizing somewhat, is don't think about what a language can do for you, but think about what you can do for a language. <laughs> English will go on thriving without you, um, but there are at least 5,500 or so other languages out there who could really use a hand from a committed polyglot. Um, now you might be saying, isn't it a contradiction that, for the that you're advocating for the abandonment of English in the very medium that you have just maligned? To that, I'd like to point out the work of Ngugi Wathiongo, who in his polemic, uh, Decolonizing the Mind, uh, called upon all African writers 
to discard the semantic husks of their colonial oppressors and continue their careers exclusively in their native African tongues. Um, but he wrote it all in English because he wanted to reach the widest group possible. Um, and then he signed off. Um, he basically said sayonara to Shakespeare and now just writes only in his native Gikuyu. So if I'll follow exa his example, then I'll, I'll try and bid adieu to English myself. But, you know, English doesn't need me anymore. I'm done. Oh, sorry, Mom and Dad, this is going to be really awkward over the holidays. <laughs> um, so I just leave you with um, fight the power, speak less English in more micro languages, and you'll be happy and healthy, though probably not wealthy, and wiser. Meu doces de Ricker, adios, I gesint, prashai rebiata. But I can answer questions in whatever language you want. <laughs> yeah. To what degree are Uzbeki and, and, and Kyrgyzi mutually in? That's a good question. I would probably say maybe about French and Spanish, about that. And the reason why is because it's, <clears throat> it's a little bit complicated because even though they're that different, the fact that both groups have lived in proximity for so long means that they're mutually intelligible to them. But if, for instance, a northern Kyrgyz comes to the south, he's like, I can't understand this language. Um, so it really just depends on, on where, what you're used to hearing in your daily life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just asking if you, uh, you feel that um, like materials for learning these micro languages are more available online or less available online or difficult to find than uh, yeah, typical languages like French, Spanish, what, what people usually learn, or the you know, common. Uh that, yeah, that was an issue that was addressed in the last presentation, that it is problematic sometimes to find microlanguage material, although the, the smallest language I speak, Yiddish, is lucky to be blessed with an abundance of online resources. There's the Yiddish Book Center, which has hundreds, maybe thousands of books that are online. Um, there's the Yiddish uh, Forwards, the Jewish Daily Forward, that I actually write articles for, so yay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it really depends on the language, I think. But um, but if you're, if you're helping, then maybe you can help to also bring that material online yourself, and that would be amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Uh, do you know if the hostility t uh, t in Uzbekistan towards Kyrgyz people is the same, to the, to the same degree as the, the hostility of Kyrgyz people towards Uzbeks? Uh, so you're asking, are, do Kyrgyz people feel the same about Uzbeks as Uzbeks feel about Kyrgyz? Yes. Uh, I would say yes, there is some resentment. Of course, not, not everyone, but Uzbeks and Kyrgyz both have stereotypes about each other. Um, the stereotype that Kyrgyz often have of Uzbeks is they're hitri, like they're sly and like you can't trust them. And um, the stereotype of Kyrgyz that Uzbeks often have, and sometimes Kyrgyz themselves, is that they're like very rude and uncultured and sort of will just say, um, yeah, they, they don't have any like refinement. Um, but yeah, I've definitely heard um, upset things from Uzbeks because they've also are reacting to this, this history of violence that happened recently. So it's understandable. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask you, when you first arrived, I wanted to ask you if you were speaking Russian to people and um, what were your, your impressions now in those po post-Soviet countries then? We have now new generations which, uh, who almost perceive Russian as an, a language of oppressor okay. rather than a, a beacon of hope, which, which Russian is for the most part. Right. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, what, what were your impressions? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, that's what's so fascinating about being there is that there's no sort of neutral language. Like Russian is also not considered neutral at all. And I would, you know, sort of get data based on people's reaction to my own speech. So I would use that to my advantage. So yeah, when I spoke in Russian or when other Kyrgyz um, or Uzbeks would speak in Russian, there's there's sort of different camps. There's some people, um, maybe Kyrgyz nationalists, who would see that as, as sort of offensive, that we need to like have everything in Kyrgyz. But there's sort of a problem in that 
all of the people who were in power when the Soviet Union fell were like the elite that were also in power during the Soviet times, and they were all Russian speaking themselves. So this awkward situation where you have this like language test to be president that like you have to do well in Kyrgyz and a lot of politicians fail it because they're really Russian speaking. Um, so yeah, you, it's still a, a mix. As long as Moscow approves, they're yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. There's a close, there's a close dependent relationship right now with, with Kyrgyz and, and Russia, that's true. But, um, but yeah, still, still there's, it's a, still a prestige language and there's a lot of damage that was done by the fact that um, Russian was sort of the language of power for so long because now Kyrgyz sort of have this um, sort of self-deprecating attitude towards their own language where they'll say things to me like, oh, our language is not developed and they're getting that directly from Russian like language ideology basically, so. Does English have a role there, maybe, as a, a more neutral language amongst young people? I've come across that, for example, in Georgia. Um, English is the language spoken by young people. It's considered neutral, and you find that in, the, uh, in some post-Soviet countries. And I think there's an American base, isn't there, in Kyrgyzstan? Yes, there used to be. Um, it closed about a, a year or two ago. It was the only country in the world that had a Russian and an American military base. but. Um, the right amount of pressure, I think, was applied such that the, the base, was, the American base is no longer there. Um, but yes, I found that in, in Osh, um, there were people in their sort of early 20s or late teens that were really excited about learning English. Um, it's, it is taught in school, um, maybe a couple hours a week, but it's not really enough usually to become fluent, but there are some sort of embassy sponsored programs where some people, and Peace Corps actually helps a lot. I, do, I did meet some Kyrgyz and Uzbeks who are very fluent in the language from Peace Corps volunteers actually. Um, but among the older generation, you definitely don't see that as much. And I remember sometimes even speaking English occasionally with a friend on a, on a bus and people would kind of be hostile to it because it's that, it's that feeling of like, I don't like that you're speaking a language that I don't understand <laughs> because they're used to like being able to understand many languages. So it's upsetting for them to like know the feeling of not, yeah, not understanding, so. Do you find that, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, do you think that this uh, hostility of somebody not speaking the right language is, uh, is solely a local thing or do you think it is, is something that goes everywhere? I think that it's definitely a universal phenomenon in the sense that we all have attitudes and ideologies about, about languages. Um, I just think that in former Soviet context in particular, it's especially loaded because you've had that shift um, in the main language of prestige going from Russian to now sort of being the national languages promoted. And so there's sort of a disconnect between um, that, that leap, so to speak. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, to comment on this uh, general discussion about multilingualism as a, as a peace project because I, I, I passionately, passionately agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to go as far as you have been. I mean, you have, you have the same problematic in, in Belgium where I live mm -hmm. or in, in, in the uh, regions of, of Spain mm -hmm. where, where language is, is used as a, as a, as a tool to, to pursue a, a, a very dodgy political message. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you have, in parallel, you have people, you have grassroots who do, uh, to do, the, op who do the opposite, who actually practice multilingualism um, quite naturally, and who acquire uh, the language of the neighbor and who switch. They don't make a big thing out of it, they they just they just do it mm -hmm. and they are they are happy doing it and it works for them. Do you did you uh, did you encounter such examples also in in the regions that that you got to know where there was just sort of natural code switching that wasn't yeah, ideologically with, loaded without them making a big deal out of it. I, absolutely, I did find that to be the case. In fact, I noticed a couple instances where even Kyrgyz people were speaking in Uzbek and it happened to be the older generation. Um, and I noticed one instance in a taxi cab where this older Kyrgyz woman and older Uzbek woman were speaking in Uzbek together. And then someone, and then a, a younger male, like 20 year old Kyrgyz cab driver walked in and then they suddenly became silent. And when they started talking and they were speaking in Kyrgyz. So I think that um, it, it depends on who your audience is. There are some people who 
effortlessly code switch without even realizing what language they're speaking. And there's others who won't even notice it until it's like pointed out to them. Like my host brother, as I mentioned, like he didn't think about the fact that he was using other languages um, until until it was noticeable and, and a foreigner saying exactly what he'd said parroted back to him. So absolutely, there is that kind of um, freedom of, of speech that is not always loaded. No, спасибо вам.